painting speaks and dances. The painting which speaks and dances is painting without painting. What does painting speak of? Painting speaks of a promise. What does what dance does painting dance? The ghost dance. I'd like to elaborate this opening statement in this paper, beginning with Jean-François Chevalier's text at the point of our departure. I'd like to invite you to the journey through the notion of deviance by excavating Baroque traits in contemporary paintings. But halfway through our excursion, I will have to take a turn, the haunting turn to let paintings, painting dance and speak, to speak um, of a promise. Chevalier begins his essay by contrasting the photographer and the artist uh, who use photography. He discusses the polemic position between, be, between them since the 1970s throughout the essay. But before such um, um, undertaking, he traces the polemics in the 19th century between, for example, Emile Zola and Charles Baudelaire. While Baudelaire bemoaned the absence of construction in the canvases of the Barbiton School painter, uh, Theodore Rousseau, um, Zola preferred to avoid the pure speculations of the imagination. Um, while photography's capacity for the objective observation, so to speak, is in a propinquity to Zola's position, photography via photomontage and collage in the 1920s shattered Tableau de la Nature that Cezanne still dreamt of. So that's our starting point, Chavarier says, it is about using the picture phone to reactivate a thinking based on fragments, openness and contradiction, not the utopian utopia of a comprehensive or systematic order. Does he mean, as Walter Benjamin says, in the field of allegorical intu intuition, the image is a fragment, or rune, or the false appear appearance of totality is extinguished? What's wrong with the utopia of a comprehensive order? Um, or systematic order. Hastily, though, I'd like to um, suggest the opposition between Chavarier generates in his essay is the discursive struggle between visuality and poetics. More than half a century after Adorno's remark to write uh, poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric, how do art and painting in particular return to the notion of poetry, poiesis to speak in a tone of seriousness and warmth and speak in silence and in ellipsis, matters of importance in this moment? by which I mean, how could I speak and how could painting speak as a historical subject, like a ghost to return to painting after the numerous murders of painting have been uh, committed? Um, in fact, Yves Lambois speaks of two and a half deaths that painting had to live through. Malevich, Duchamp, and its part resurrection by, resurrection by Mondrian. So he touches, uh, he concludes by arriving at an optimistic narrative, so to speak, that the match of painting that is, the modernist painting is over, but the players of painting return to the game of painting as in the game of chess. To, f uh, to follow Boa, uh, photorealism, photorealism and its de um, divergent forms, another, are they another set of uh, matches? Um, the exhibition at the Haywood Gallery in London in uh, 2007, entitled The Painting of Modern Life, titled after Baudelaire's The Painters of Modern Life, created by Ralph Rugoff, uh, was recent survey of the paintings which had intricate liaison with photography. The exhibition was more a summary than a forecast. Okay, we see some of the examples. Um, Robert Bechtel via Selmins and um, uh, Johannes Kahn, um, Marlene Duma, and um, so on and so forth, um, including um, Eberhard Havikost, uh, Franz Gersh. Um, for instance, while Be um, Bechtel and Gersh um, have approached both photography and painting by deploying the mimetic ability of both photography and painting, um, though different from the 19th century realism or the 19th century painting which used photographs, Doig, Doig and Duma, in contrast, um, moved away, move away from the original photographs as they refer to, um, in order to make their painted interpretations of the photograph their signatures. That is to say, the, inventing, in, the inventiveness of the painters is measured by the difference they have made from their original photographs. However, this rem remains still rather straightforward at the opposite end of the spectrum from Bechtel and Gerge. Meanwhile, Richter's paintings, by emphasizing its photographic quality in painterly manner, um, um, 
instead of working against the assert painting similarity paradoxically, it is, a, it is as if to twist and turn a piece of fabric. The painting reserves painting less by becoming photographs, that is to say, painting without painting. Photo, photorealism and its deviant forms have deployed a convincing strategy of, ma strategy of matching the Shonian notion ready-made with photographs and tapped on the blurry distinction between the realism and immediate image, um, I mean mechanically reproduced images, photographs. Despite, the, despite that, those works share not only photographic sense of realism, photographic institutional framing, well, this photographic institutional framing, which is a legacy of the 17th century ocular centrism, as photographic image is optic because it's ocular in its characteristics. If definition of the ocular refers to the eye as the, um, the organ par excellence of perception and acquisition of knowledge, the optic refers to the filtering the vision with the lens. As a consequence, photographic image is scopic, that is viewing mediated by a mechanical device brackets the distance between the object observation and the observer. Its colonial and military implications are obvious. For example, the recent military technology aims at annihilating the difference between the recognition of an enemy and the enemy as a target. For instance, a device which uh, reacts to the pilot's eye, uh, eye movement bypasses the process of pressing a button and shoots the enemy. In other words, it overcomes the biological limit of human recognition action sensorium. This is perhaps the frontier of, the, of um, ocular science in practice, and the malevolence of the eye gives a license to the objections to ocular, optic, and scopic regime. Despite that, painting and photography as a fate rather than nature have to live with their visuality, although the suspicion against vision has been already expressed in the myth of Jupiter and Io, in which Jelas Juno, employing Argus, um, known as or nicknamed as Panoptes, with his 100 eyes to watch over Io, um, which is now um, turned into a cow. And um, um, the hostage, so she is the hostage of love. However, Mercury, the son of Jupiter, actually, the Jupiter is the son, oh, sorry, the um, the husband of um, uh, Juno. So he sends Mercury uh, playing the flute of, uh, and then he plays uh, the flute of Pan and lulls all the all seeing Argus to sleep. In, other, in another example, the surrealist tactically privileged madness of vision, la folie uh, de la vision, in dreams against clarity of vision. Painting as an object generates the beholder's sensual interaction spatial response to it. That is to say, an aesthetic experience instead of a poetic experience. Poiesis is a good brother of a troubled aesthesis, another name for affect or perception. Bifurcated brothers, aesthesis and poiesis, as brothers do, compete and fight, as if to illustrate the difference between totality and fragment, real and imaginary. Poiesis to follow Martin Heidegger and Philippe Lacolabat means bringing forth. In fact, um, Lacola Bart uses the word hair for bringing, so hair for bringing, and um, um, also letting come, up, come about, um, fair and lesson. Um, that's a self fiction force to, to produce, produce as pr pro meaning into the future, um, the action in, um, as an action. In fact, um, and Benjamin, so it's a self fiction force and uh, a force for production. Benjamin, along with uh, Christine Bussey um, Glucksmann, reminds us that the Baroque is another discourse in which poiesis through allegory prevailed, following Karl Horst, who said, allegory is always to reveal a crossing of the borders of different mode, and an advance of the plastic arts into the territory of the rhetorical arts. Benjamin defines allegory as dialectic at the standstill. Here, I'd like to link my discussion to the Baroque, which is an open garden full of allegories and poetic explore, explorations. The term Baroque was applied for the first time by the critic Francesco Milizia in the 18th century, perhaps similar to the, um, um, did I show that one? Oh, sorry. Um, perhaps similar to our contemporary term kitsch, a rather derogatory term to indicate the, uh, the style which embraces exaggerate, exaggerated decor and expressiveness through, um, excessiveness rather, uh, throughout the 17th century. Among a few claims over the etymological origins of the word baroque, the Portuguese word in the 16th century barocco referred to a deformed pearl, which suggests a deviant deviation from a norm. According to the Swiss art historian um, Heinrich uh, Wolfling, who specialized in the Baroque, 
the Baroque never offers us perfection and fulfillment, or the static calm of being, only the unrest of change and the tension of transience. He distinguishes the Baroque as its emphasis, emph emph emphasis on movement and exuberance from the Renaissance paintings, which exhibit clarity and the balanced competitions. However, Michel Unholy demonstrates how much the contrast Wolfling generated between the high Renaissance, or this is supposed to be Renaissance, and the Baroque is unsustainable. Holly argues that the Baroque has become a category with the imposed difference from the Renaissance, as for instance in the case of Raphael, such differences on the basis of categories such as line versus painterly, clarity versus ambiguity become unconvincing when looking at this painting. <laughs> 